most businesses are getting smart and they're not paying the processing fees anymore. They pass the, call it a credit card fee. They pass that cost onto their customers and they give them the option of paying with a wire or ACH or they can pay with a credit card and pay a fee. That's what most of our people do. And we love those accounts because if you're not paying fees and you've got great service and the right technology that helps your business grow and run, why would you ever leave us? You know, like back in the day when I started 10 years ago, we were competing on price mostly. Now it's based on three pillars. We talk about our three pillars of payments, technology, pricing, service. That's it. It's either going to be no fees to the business because they, they decide to offset their costs with either a dual pricing or a cash discount program, or they get offered a pricing structure where they are paying the fees their business does, and it's transparent, fully disclosed, and consistent. everybody josh wilson back here at the big dog podcast we got a good one for you guys today what's going on son what's up you doing all right yeah i'm good i want to introduce uh the man from the world of payment processing the king if you will adam niece he he's not just a payment processor he's a friend He's a colleague. We do a lot of business together, particularly over the last year and gotten to know his business and his team really, really well. They always come in in those clutch moments. So, you know, they're there in the regular day to day moments. And we're like, man, we need to get you on the show and talk about rate tracker payments and, and what you guys do for the world. I mean, and, and, and everyone, not just us dog guys out here. So Adam Neese, welcome to the Big Dog Podcast, my friend. How's it going? I'm good, man. Thanks for having me. The, yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, when, when, you, when we were talking about doing this, I was really excited because um, I've heard great things about your podcast and got to listen to a couple episodes and I'm, I'm grateful to be on here now. So thank you. Oh, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. So Adam and I met, a couple of years back uh, through business association, um, Apex actually, and you know, kind of got connected through there and would see each other at different meetings from time to time and stuff like that. Started talking maybe, gosh, I don't know, 18 months ago about bringing, you know, my businesses over and how that might be a fit and some unique things about what we do and issues we had ran into in the past. And, you know, Adam made it super easy to, to figure out a right solution, you know, for us. And cause, cause for me, it was always about, you know, speed of one, us getting our money two ease of processing those things. Cause you know, for us, our primary business, you know, we're processing payments over the phone. We don't have a terminal where people are, you know, presenting their card in person. And so for underwriting that creates some different, you know, issues and concerns and then a delayed delivery of, of service creates all these concerns. And there's all this stuff that goes into the world of payment processing that no one ever thinks about because we just show up with, you know, our credit card and we're like, okay, you know, we tap the little thing and, you know, our money gets taken out and we don't think about everything that goes into the back end of it. And having been a business owner for going on 20 years now, I've dealt with a lot of different companies and a lot of different payment processors. And I've never, ever, had the support and communication and the level of professionalism that I've had these last, you know, year to 18 months that we've been dealing with you guys. And it's just blown my mind. And we've tried to, to feed a lot of people to you and get those introductions going and stuff. But what was it? I guess talk to me a little bit about, you know, what you were doing, how you were doing it and what got you to the point where you're like, you know what? It's time for me to do this in a different way and ultimately get rate tracker going and launched because it's different brother dude thank you man i that i that's one of the nicest things anyone's ever said to me and i appreciate <laughs> that <laughs> i'll give a little background my story starts when i was in college my buddy and i had an idea he had the original idea and i was the one that's like dude let's fucking do something with this yeah um it was the idea of having uh your rewards cards that you would get at like the coffee shop and the, de the deli whatever all that would be on one card that you already have in your wallet. So we decided that driver's license and credit card 
would be how consumers would be able to join all these rewards programs without having to take out 50 pieces of plastic. Right. 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 That was what it was like 15 years ago, to, I guess 12, whatever. Now we kept trying to get this thing to market. We was my first startup. I had no clue what I was doing and it just didn't really pan out. But I, when I graduated from college, I started in payments. I love small business. Payment processing looked cool. I didn't even know it exists. Like you said, I, I just took my credit card and tap it and it just works, you know? Yeah. But people don't, a lot of people don't know about the payments industry because it's like an invisible, magical thing that just happens um, for the cardholder. And I got into that space selling loyalty programs. I wanted to learn how to sell. I wanted to build relationships with small businesses and make money and also work from home. That's what I did. So I sold for a company for five years. Uh, they were acquired for 4.3 billion. During that time when I was there, I did I, I resigned from the job to start my startup, the loyalty program. It failed within 30 days. And I just basically was like, I'm not doing this. Payment processing is way too cool. Right. Um, I almost did that, like followed through with it because I felt like I had to. Um, I sure. So I got back into payments and then I was there for that with that company for another couple of years. I didn't agree with how they were ethically doing business. Like I just didn't, they were doing, starting to do things that were like other credit card processors. And I just wasn't down for that. The yeah. thing that attracted me to them out of college was their reputation and they were honest. Basically their core values aligned with mine. And when that changed, I was like, I'm not doing this anymore. So I, yeah. I started my own payments company and, um, coming up on five years of being self-employed in the industry. And I have learned and grown a lot. And one of the main problems that I see in the industry is like what you just said, like you, your business type is different than a restaurant. You, you guys have future delivery. It's card, not present. You're sending invoices. You're dealing with uh, a, a service that is somewhat not risky. It's just a little bit different than yeah. you know, buying something at a, at a restaurant. So your business needs a team of people that understand you, the bank knows you and they understand your business so they can underwrite you, get you approved, and then you can grow your business. So that's basically what we call it white glove payment processing is all about. Um, and that is what businesses like yours need. Now, some businesses can get away with like just signing up for Stripe and letting Stripe process their payments. It's easy. It's quick, simple, easy. Same thing with Square, PayPal. Sure. Yeah. And like in exchange for that simple sign up and that easy experience for the for the business, you get money freezes, you get reserves put on, you get no no little to no customer service, um, and a big company that doesn't actually care about the customer. Yeah. Now, I respect those big companies because they're worth billions of dollars and they sure. do it quickly. Um, I just believe in good service, good communication, correctly set up accounts and scalability. Yeah. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I had for years worked with Chase and okay. on their payment processing side, I mean, years and millions and millions and millions of dollars processed through them. Never an issue, never headaches, never whatever, maybe once every 18 months, I'd get a, you know, an email saying, Hey, you know, we've had a couple chargebacks, you know, or whatever the, the ratio is a little higher than normal. You know, please remember this is like our ratios. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, no problem. I mean that with the volume we deal with inevitably that is going to happen from time to time. Yeah, and so people just not liking our refund policies or who knows what it may be. And so they want to do that. And then we go in battle. Well, years I worked with those jokers and any time there was a issue or a question, it, it was next to impossible to, to reach anyone. It was next to impossible to get any answers. Everything would be mailed. Nothing was just communicated electronically. And maybe there's some regulations within that industry that requires it to be mailed versus emailed or whatever. But I, I got to believe there's better ways to handle certain things. And the thing that kind of broke the the camel's back for me at messing up that saying is all of a sudden I wasn't getting my deposits. Mm. And this is after years and years and years, millions and millions of dollars processed through them every day, very steady, similar transactions, nothing changes. And I'm like, what's going on? So I call. And I actually do finally get a hold of somebody and like, well, Mr. Wilson, 
Um, we've got a $75,000 reserve we're putting in place. Once that's met, we'll start your deposits back up again. Jesus. And it wasn't like we're taking half your payments till we get this reserve. It was, we're going to sit on 75. And I just started cracking up laughing on the phone. They were like, until we get to $75,000, we aren't releasing. I'm like, can you tell me why? Wow. Can you like, I had no problem with any of my other providers. Everything else is cool. It was, I always thought that using the merchant processor attached to my bank. So all of our accounts are there. Everything is seen just from a bundle type standpoint. We were an ideal client. Yeah, so I thought, and they said, well, nope. And so I, I appealed twice and they're like, no, cause I loved it, man. Any payment I ran by 11 o'clock at night was in my account the next morning. Right. right. The, the fees honestly were uber competitive because the volume that we did, the fees were very low. Um, and for that, I had no customer service. I had no communication. I had nothing except for, Hey, I had my money and that was cool with me. And so it was right. fine until it wasn't. And so I said, guys, I will literally turn this off right now. Like you will never see a $75,000 reserve from me. That's not happening. And um, at that point, they were about 15 to $20,000 in to the reserve because, and that was only a couple of days or two, you know, we're running payments. And, yeah, exactly. Um, but I noticed no deposits. And so they were like, well, um, we'll, we'll sit on this. You know, and after six months, you know, they can be released or it was a nine months, I think was the number they gave. This has been a year and a half now. I've never seen those dollars. They don't have a they don't have a record of those dollars, Adam. Oh, wow. That You know, and it's so it's been, it's a whole nother mess that we're like dealing with with Chase yeah. on that. And it's fine and it'll get figured out and handled. But it's. Nobody knows anything. Their left hand to their right hand. And no one talks. Nobody communicates. And so we had an interim processor that we used for a bit, and it was fine. And then we made the switch to Rate Tracker. Now, I have a rep who just texts me, hey, Josh, hope you're doing well. Checking in. I got a rep I forget lives across the world, and I'm shooting him a text or message. It's probably the middle of the damn night. And, you know, you know, like when he's sleeping and sure enough, you know, he'll, he'll see his phone. He's like, Oh, give me one second. And, you know, Josh is answering me and I'm forgetting and you know, that he's different part of the world. And yeah. man, the support piece has been insane. We've, we've done thousands and thousands and thousands of transactions with you guys. I think we've had three problems. Yeah. None driven by you guys. But you all went to war for us to battle to hold these other companies accountable to make things right. Mm -hmm. And it didn't take up a bunch of our time. It didn't add a bunch of stress or concern. Um, I will go as far as to say in the beginning when we had a conflict and it really hemmed us up, you know, you personally went out of your way to make something right. For me yeah. and my business, you talking about the twenty grand? Yeah, man. Yeah, like that was that, that the situation there, dude. The processor was wrong, and that's why I I did that because sometimes the banks move slow, man, and like I, they just they no offense, but their that company is they have a hundred thousand clients, and they they yeah. they made a mistake on their end. Yeah, in my opinion, um, and that's why I was willing to do that, and then you you paid me back, so that's. Great. Well, that's the thing that's so crazy is that just so unheard of. It was a very unique situation. It was a shit show of yeah. coincidences that happened at once. There was a cash flow crunch. Adam's like, hey, we didn't screw this up, but they're a part of us through how we're, you know, the process that we're going. They're wrong. I'm going to make it right. We all made it right. It was like a 24 hour thing. Mm -hmm. But it was just, it was incredible to me, ownership and accountability, right? And, and resourcefulness um, that you stepped in with. One of our core values, you mentioned core values earlier. One of the core values of my company is ownership. You know, good or bad, we own our shit. And, you oh, know, yeah. and, and we learn from it and we move forward and we grow. And it's, 
again, whether it's a good or a bad thing, like we own it. And now how do we you know, make sure that doesn't happen again? How do we learn from that? How do we grow from that? If this is a good thing, yeah, own it. You deserve that praise. You earn that. Um, but that ownership there, that's not something you see in a lot of companies. Yeah. And that blew my mind because we were just, we were a brand new client to you at that point. Yeah, man. I knew you though. Like I, it was, right. that's fair. something that, I mean, that's risky for sure. Right. Yeah. But dude, I, I, I saw the situation. I realized the solution and it was just easy for you that way. And that's like my job is to make yeah. collecting money invisible. Right. Yeah. Um, and it should just be a thing for every business that money comes in. It's correct. It's accurate. The, you know, all that stuff. And, um, it's just the way that payment processing works is it's always changing. There's always something broken. And like yeah. our team just loves to solve problems, man. And it, it's, it's really cool to hear that Josh is texting you, um, seeing how you're doing. Like, he's, yeah. I mean, obviously you guys have worked with a lot of our clients together and the dude is amazing. He's the salt of the earth and he, yeah. uh, he works hard and, and like, that is what it's all about. Most for most people, some businesses don't care. Like they just want a simple solution. You know, they don't, they don't need to talk to somebody, but like, again, for your business type, it's necessary. And you know what? Um, that is a weird thing that you mentioned about chase with the 75 K or the reserve. Yeah. Cause like I hear, I'll break that down for you and anybody that wants to understand why payment processors, uh, impose that kind of stuff on people, reserves, uh, freezes, shutdowns, it's because they don't want to lose money, right? So yeah. when you run a credit card, say I run a $10,000 transaction and I pay your business 10 grand, right? You will receive that money the next day, at least you should. Uh, right. It's 2024, everybody should have next day funding. <laughs> you would receive that money. And then let's say you fulfill the services and I, the card holder, am not pleased or I want my money back and you say no, or it was a fraudulent transaction or I stole a card, whatever. Yeah. Anytime money has to go back to the cardholder, whether it's a refund or a reversal or a chargeback, banks don't like that. Yeah, they'll process refunds all the time. It's normal, right? If you return sure. something, but if it's a chargeback, that shows conflict and that shows potential losses, right? Yeah. Usually, the threshold for a merchant is about one or one and a half percent. Yeah. What a bank, a high risk bank or a payment processor will accept. There's also like restrictions from Visa and MasterCard on that, too, because they want businesses to do good business. And if you have a 10 percent chargeback rate, you're right. probably doing something fraudulent or you suck yeah. at what you do. And they don't yeah. want you to have the privilege of taking credit cards. It's unfortunate, but it's their world. We just. Play yeah. it. But in your case. I bet you that you probably had a, an irate customer or somebody that disputed you a few times or whatever. And um, Chase didn't see it as a, a favorable scenario for them. And I, I don't know. I'm speculating. Sure. But yeah. this. So here's well, clearly how they didn't. <laughs> yeah. So what they, what they and they, they probably did some sort of risk assessment and they figured out that the the risk exposure was somewhere around 75 grand because you do a lot of volume. Right. Yeah. And they. They felt that that 75K would cover their potential losses. Um, and I'll give you a recent example. We had a client that did like 360 grand with us in the first three months. Turned out to be a, a fraud merchant or not fulfilling or doing something that was that led to 120,000 in chargebacks. Okay. Wow. And yeah. There's still, there's still more chargebacks and there's no money in that business's bank account. So every time that happens, the bank gets clipped for five grand, 10 grand, whatever. Um, and those chargebacks have to be funded somewhere because the money, but the money was already spent. Yep. The reserve that they had was a hundred K because it's a high risk business, you know, very, it's a debt remediation company. They're okay. as, risky, as risky as it gets. Um, the bank took the risk though, because they, it's a, it's a high volume profitable account, right? Yeah. So the hundred K in the reserve got, the, it, it absorbed it was hundred percent used to fund the chargebacks because there's no money in the bank account. And then the 20 K over the reserve is what was actually true losses for the bank. And okay. it's growing. So maybe it's at 40 K now. I don't know, but what's going to happen, dude, they're going to go into litigation, uh, collections, whatever, to get that 40,000 and to get the money. It's like, it's really tough. Like it's basically like an unsecured line of credit is what a merchant right. 
really is. And you know what? Most businesses don't have issues. It's like some that just do because of a bad customer. It's their business model. Like you're like, again, you're not selling Girl Scout cookies. You have a high ticket offer with future delivery. And like this right. that stuff happens. It's why you need a team like ours to help you with that in that situation. Because Chase isn't going to communicate with you and they're not going to help you find the, the the perfect solution. They're just going to say, All right, no, we're going to sell 75K in this reserve. Screw you. We don't care. Of course, you're going to get a new processor. That's probably yeah. what they wanted. No offense. Right. right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's sure. a weird dude. Banks. Like my brother's a banker and he's so weird. Right. <laughs> <laughs> he's my best friend. Though, but, um, all they do is drink and golf, man. Side note. <laughs> Bankers don't have to work because their money works for them. <laughs> That's right. That's right. That's you know, right. Payment processes are working our asses off for pennies and uh, residual money, but <laughs> it, it, it works out at the end. But um, They're clicking well, buttons, holding on to more money and reinvesting it elsewhere. Yeah, dude. Yeah, it's not even their <laughs> money, too. Like, It's wild how it works. Banking is such a cool thing. I don't know. Anyway, I digress. We should be talking about payment processing. But so where was I going with that? Oh, yeah. Like, they they don't really care. No offense. And, yeah. and even though they had your banking, like, do you still bank with them? No. Yeah, there you go. They lost a the partial, fire. partial. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. And so, you know, I mean, in those situations, because like we, we, my company's big enough that we have problems like that every day. Like literally yeah, sure. every day, there's something. And that's where our team comes in. You need, you, you know, we, we, we like to be the buffer the trusted expert, the consult, whatever you want to say for our clients. And it's a partnership because if they're successful and they keep processing their payments, their sales rep gets paid a residual every month. And then so does their sales director, which is Daniel. I'm sure you've talked. Yeah. To yeah. Great. Um, and the company makes a, a gross profit. That's how we, that's how we grow and thrive. So it's in our, it's literally in our best interest to make sure our people take care of. And I take pride in, in us executing on that every day, you know? Um, yeah. And so, and I do the, thank you for saying those kind words. You know, it's like, it's uh, it's really cool when you get to do business with people like you that are friends, clients, referral partners, like it's, sure. I mean, I'm, I'm, and to hear that kind of stuff is like, you know, you made my day and it's only, you know, 11 o'clock here. So, well, you. you know, it's like one of those things where, you know, man, this idea works. The idea is <laughs> working, right? Because we, we all had, when we all started doing whatever it is that we're doing, it was just an idea. It was a concept. And sure, maybe somebody else has been doing it. Payment pro Starting a payment processing company wasn't an original idea. No, There's no. hundreds of thousands of them, if not millions of payment processing companies, <laughs> brokers, <laughs> agents, whatever. And But it can be done differently. You know, when I look at the dog training side, I'm like, we're dog trainers. We're not curing cancer. We're not nuclear physicists. We're not like, you know, we're not saving the world. There's nothing that serious about it. Anybody who's a good human being and is maybe not even passionate about animals could be a good dog trainer, right? Mm -hmm. If you're coachable, you're a good person. Like I can teach you how to be a good, really damn good dog trainer pretty quickly. Hmm. You know, it's not, it's not anything crazy like that. There's, there's tons of them out there, particularly now there's gajillions of dog trainers out there because we made it look cool. We made it look profitable. We took it to social media and online and people realized, Oh, this could be something we can make a living at. Right. And now there's tons and tons and tons. 10 years ago, man, there weren't hundreds of dog training companies. There's just like, mom and pop little shops and they train dogs. They got their little storefront. Now it's everywhere. I'm going to train dogs. I just wouldn't want to do it a little bit differently. I wanted to create an experience that's different for the client. I wanted to create an experience that's different for the dogs and I'm not reinventing anything, but I am doing it different. And that's what I have found, you know, with, with you guys, right? Like it's payment processing. I told you, you know, you could have set me up with anybody you know, to work with and stuff. But I had some particular requests, you know, again, I want it to be easy for my sales team, right? I don't need them entering 50 million pieces of data. You know, we're, we're over the phone 99.8% of the time. It's, it's card not in hand. And I had some stuff and I, I trusted you to, to put together a solution for me, which you did. And then we have the ongoing support of the team that's in place. Who's incredible. And they're bought into it. It's just different. It's a different way of doing it. And that's where it's always cool. You're talking about five years in and you're like, oh, yeah, this is working. This is working. We've got, yeah. we got people who are interested in our company, right? Other companies who are interested in 
our company and oh there's valuations there's am i it am i am i oh shit this might yeah. work i'm doing this right and that's a cool feeling because you saw a better way to do it you left a situation you didn't feel good about core values mm-hmm. right and leave that situation you didn't feel good about anymore to go on your own in your own direction in a way that you knew you could kind of control those value-based decisions and stuff like that. What talk to, talk to us a little bit about that core value piece. You know, what, what makes the core value so important to you and what is it about you that you knew with that previous company, when things started to change, it was easy to walk away. So, um, man, that's a great question. So we have nine core values and I can think of two that apply to that notion of like, why I left number one is long game. Meaning like when you, when you deal with people, you play the long game in most yeah. situations. Right. Um, sometimes you have to, you know, put your foot down and, and do the right thing as well and, and cut a relationship off. I've done that many times. Yeah. So there's that. And then also always do the right thing. Right. Um, in payment processing business in general, it's very easy to lie. Mostly, I mean, especially in my industry, like I've, I've analyzed, I don't know how many, a couple thousand credit card statements. I've just for reference, I've personally signed about 750 accounts of myself in my career. Yeah. I don't sell accounts anymore because, um, it's not fair or good for anyone. Right. Like I just don't have the bandwidth and I, I would rather them have Joshua, for example, to be there yeah. to take care of them, you know? that's what every merchant deserves. And I just can't do that anymore. I got three kids uh, that are under five and uh, you know, my wife too. So I, that's my family's my focus. And um, I, I, my goal is to work less and, and uh, be with them more and play more golf. Right. But um, now back to what I was saying, the thing that there was a couple things after I joined apex, I realized that I was meant to be a business owner and I actually wanted to be a digital marketer mm-hmm. <laughs> at that point. I've done a lot of, you know, I had a lot of different ideas and payment processing has been the one thing that I've stuck with like for 10 years. I've had projects, ideas, things that I launched that failed, all that shit. Um, and payments is my thing, man. I love it. And I got, we got an email one day from the chief sales officer of that company that they let us know that they would start, they're going to begin charging uh, $125 a month for PCI non-compliance fees, right? On the merchant's, they're on their credit card statements. Now I bet you it's like 5% of all businesses actually read their statement. And then, yeah. and then maybe 10% of those people actually understand it. Right. I mean, like I said, I've been doing this for a long time, looked at thousands of statements and sometimes we get statements that our team can't decipher. They send it to me and I'm like, Holy shit. So then I have to, I have to go to my mentor who's uh, you know, he's been in the industry for 25 years and he, he helps me with that stuff. But sure. um, it's just so easy to lie. And I think it's wrong to do it. Like, yes, we need to make a profit just like your business, but like, why not just be fully disclosed with it? And then like, make sure that everything is consistent. You know, like I created rate tracker because I do not believe in, in egregious rate increases, you know, businesses that get added, you know, a transaction, more transaction costs, or uh, it's called a discount rate, which is the percentage the business pays. You know, I think it's wrong to add five, six, seven hundred dollars a month unknowingly to the merchant, to the yeah. business. I mean, that adds up, dude. And like the mom and pop pizza shop or a lot of your dog trainers, dude, they they don't know how fees work or what's fair. And I think that it should be it should be fair for the business profitable to the processor and then consistent over time. So I built a software rate tracker that's free for any business out there. If you take credit cards, you can use my software for free and it will send you a text and an email every month. Very simple information. What were, how much did you process? What was your fee? What were your total fees? And what was your rate? Your yeah. rate is what matters out the door. Your rate should stay the same. It should, you know, I, I always tell people this when they ask about rates and fees, 95% of our clients fall somewhere between Two percent and three and a half percent. There are there are low risk, high volume businesses such as a grocery store is a great example, or an auto repair shop that they can have a rate lower than two percent because of the nature of their business, how they take cards, the rates that Visa and Mastercard assess to them. It's called interchange, right? Yeah. Um, and then there's businesses that are above three and a half percent because they're high risk. They they have they take cards over the phone or on an invoice or their average ticket's really high, so they get a lot of credit cards. There's many things that affect the rate, but the effective rate, which is the 
out the door costs, essentially how much did you pay to process how much you sold? That should be pretty consistent if you pay your own fees, right? Right. Most businesses are getting smart and they're not paying the processing fees anymore. They pass the, the, we call, you know, call it a credit card fee, whatever you want to call it. They pass that cost onto their customers and they give them the option of paying with a wire or ACH, or they can pay with a credit card and pay a fee. Right. Um, that's what most of our people do. And, and we love those accounts because if you're not paying fees and you've got great service and the right technology that helps your business grow and run, why would you ever leave us? You know, like right. back in the day, yeah. when I started 10 years ago, we were competing on price mostly. Now it's based on three pillars. We talk about our three pillars of payments, technology, pricing, service. That's it. Mm-hmm. It's either going to be no fees to the business and, you know, cause they, they decide to offset their costs with either a dual pricing or a cash discount program, or, um, they, they get offered a pricing structure where that they are paying the fees their business does. And it's transparent, fully disclosed and consistent. That's how we do it. Yeah. I've always been that way. You know what, man, we, like if I wanted to make more money, I could just increase rates. You know, like we can do that. We let them sure. know the statement. They, they may or may not read the statement, let alone get it. And if they know, if it's a $200 a month increase and you do, you know, 80 grand a month in credit card fees, you think they're going to know? Like, right. Pizza yeah. shop doing a million bucks a year. We give them a quarter percent increase. We can do that. They would pay an additional $2,500 a year. And they're not going to know. Right. If they do know it's because they are shopping for a new processor. And I could put that rate increase in place today. If they're not shopping for a new processor until October, they would have already paid us like two, two grand more than what they were expecting to. And I think that's wrong. So that's why yeah. I built the software. That's why I want businesses to know their costs. It's not just about the rate. Like you said, it's about technology and service. But if they do pay their own fees, it should be fair and transparent. So I will yeah. always operate that way, you know? It's funny. So you, you talked about those three pillars and the ranking for me is tech, service, fee. Nice. Right. If, if, if the tech is smooth, like with regards to payment processing, you know, because, you know, I've I've had people tell me, well, Josh, you know, I pay less than that. I'm like, sure you do. Let's tech our let's text our reps. Let's pretend we have a problem. Can you do that? No. OK, let's run a payment. Can your sales team do that in 15 seconds? In a very easy manner for the customer who isn't getting worn out with stupid questions and rolling their eyes and all that stuff? Or do you need to fill them with, you know, their, their full, you know, house mortgage application, right. For them to run a payment for you over the phone. And so for me, it's the tech, it's the service. And then that fee, I don't, I mean, I appreciate, I think the fee is competitive. I think it's more than fair, particularly for the support and the technology that we have. Now, if something happened, I'm also very confident that if something happened and I needed to change up um, how we're processing payments, I'm going to reach out to Josh and say, hey, Josh, this particular um, software that we're running stuff through isn't it for us anymore. I need I need to pivot. This is what I'm looking for. He's going to find a solution for me that'll meet that need. Yep. And right now that meets our need with some of my other companies. You know, it's it's not it's almost all invoices, no payments over the phone, stuff like that. There's other options that, you know, I would need to look at that are different than the dog training side. The dog training side is just the prominent. That's the big one. But it's easy for the sales team. It's easy for the customer. Um, And now the less time they're spending on processing, the more time they're spending talking to potential clients. Yeah. You know, if I can take a three minute process down to. 15 seconds. Why would we not do that? Yep. And people are like, oh, well, you know, I pay, you know, 0.05 less of a rate. <laughs> well, if I, I don't care. And time is more valuable. Like, man. like I don't, <laughs> like, I'm about the 4X the amount of deals we do over the course of a week <laughs> simply because I have more time to do it. And the guy's so, sitting there talking about five basis points. Right. Just and for reference, that's $50 what are we doing? on every hundred grand processed. <laughs> and that's the part that has been really 
when I'm talking to folks about, hey, reaching out to you and, and providing them, you know, contact info and stuff, or they'll come back to me and ask me what I'm doing. Cause I'll show them my stuff. I don't care. And, and we can walk sure. through it. I'll show them like the feet. Like it's simple. It's so simple. And it doesn't have to be a stressor. And it's like, what are you, what are you hung up on? And some people can't, they get so hung up on the smallest of detail. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and not that the details matter. Details are very, very important. Don't get me wrong, but how does it actually impact what you're trying to accomplish? Is this the biggest thing that you need to that needs to play into how you make your decision of who you partner with and who you work with? Probably not. No, probably not. But for so many, it's just that thing. And what I have found with the people who have um, come on and joined Rate Tracker. Man, I hear all the time about how great Josh is or Daniel, you know, or the back end team or the setup process was easy. Man, we, I think we got a dozen plus people we've sent over y'all's way. Yeah, and, I, I, I checked. I think it was. We're so going to keep cool. rolling. We're going to keep yeah. rolling and, and doing that. And, you know, for those who are listening today, we'll, we'll drop a, a link that you can use to contact, you know, Adam and his team and um, to learn more. Cause I'm telling you, if, if you've got your, if you're processing payments right now, in your company, at a minimum, have a have a phone call, send your statements over, get them get them reviewed. If you don't, I'm not, I don't care about understanding what was all dialed into my old merchant processing statements. <laughs> Again, I, I never was taking the time to do that. Adam just said probably five percent of people do it, and ten percent of those five percent know what the hell they're looking at. Yeah, I'm a dipshit dog trainer. <laughs> I don't know what I'm looking at. I don't know what that what that stuff means. So for me, that service piece is really important that I got someone that I trust that I can count on. If if you're running all your stuff through Square, if you're running all your stuff through Stripe, if you're running all your stuff through, you know, PayPal or whatever, all companies that I've used over the past, it's fine. Mm-hmm. But you're you're paying, guys. Trust me, you're paying. And there is not support there. There are better options out there in this world than that. Oh, well, this integrates, Josh, with my with my CRM or this integrates with whatever. Guess what, y'all? Guess what? Rate Tracker can integrate in a lot of things, too. And yeah. it's really, really awesome. And it's really, really simple. So I would highly encourage you to have a conversation because conversation costs you nothing. And um, I think you'll be really, really pleased with what you find out through these conversations uh, with Adam and his team. And again, we'll drop a link, you know, on here for people to do that real simple. You fill out a couple little things and someone from the team is going to reach out to you. What type of businesses are, are not good for y'all to work with, Adam? Are there are there any are there any niches where you're like, hey, guys, if you're listening, we're probably not a good fit for you? Um, you know, it's that's a great question. I, like some business types that we've had great success with are obviously dog trainers, right? <laughs> First thing that comes to mind. Um, I love working with convenience stores, delis, markets, auto repair, bars, restaurants, quick service restaurants are great. And I think that they're going to grow over yeah. the next 15 years. I actually think your industry is going to grow like crazy. And you know why? What's because, that? because millennials don't want to have kids. They'd rather have dogs. Yeah. So like, dude, what I, I've thought about this and I want to build, I was thinking about building software specifically designed for dog trainers. And that's maybe something we can talk about. Yeah. We need to integrate payments. We'd help them with invoice, all the stuff that they do that's designed literally perfectly around that niche, because I think it's going to grow. And if it's going to grow, then that means that um, there'll be more payments flowing through there and there's more opportunity. Right. Yeah. Now we've got the software. We're about to start pushing it. Hell yeah. Hard. We, okay. and so we do need to talk about that because yeah. we're about to start pushing it publicly probably in the next 30 days announcement Beautiful. announcement coming uh you know it's like yeah. it, and so but it's cool but it's gonna it's gonna change for the whether that small time operator or their large scale like like where we're at and growing um, it's going to be able to help with efficiencies and client experience and management and really pet industry wide. The entire pet industry, I agree with you, is it, it's always quickly growing. But yeah. you're exactly right. People waiting to have kids or not having those kids and the dogs are that piece 
whether it's the groomers, whether it's the daycares, the boarders, the veterinarians, the trainers. It's really a limitless opportunity it is, uh, for, sure. for anybody who's in that market, as long as you're not a piece of shit human being. <laughs> if you're a piece of shit human being, my team and I will hunt you down and drag you through the streets if you're shitty to these animals. And, yeah. you know, it's funny. It, Logan, pop in here real quick. I see you smirking. Pop in here real quick. I have a question. Your mom, I don't want to forget. Adam's like, what the hell? Well, this is what happens with me, Adam. I go off um, on a tangent. What did I, what was I hearing this morning? It woke me up. I thought our dogs were like in pain. What no, was I hearing? I, it woke me up. I ran out to go see if our dogs were okay. It was a dog across the street in the driveway. Like by itself? No, it's an owner. It, it wanted to go at another dog and it was like mad that it wasn't. So was it on a leash? Yeah. And oh, all right, well, I need don't say it on the podcast. I need you to point out to me, though, when we get home tonight, whose house it is, because that dog, it, it was bad. It didn't sound OK. And I need to find out who it is and talk to them about how they treat their dog, because that I jumped up out of the bed it was early. And I thought something happened to I thought Coyote was in the backyard or something, got a hold of one of the dogs. I didn't know what was happening. So across the street from us. Yeah, they were walking by. All right. You know, you said something that is really, really something to pay attention to. You can be, you basically said you could be successful in your industry as long as you're not a piece of shit person. That's yeah, true, true for anything. All right. Like that's, right. Yeah. Yeah, that's true in payments. It's true in banking. It's true in uh, anything. Right. There's, and, and like I've heard a lot of people say negative things about the payments industry. Um, business lenders love to talk shit about each other and they say, Oh, they're predatory. I mean, there's good people and bad people in every industry. Right. Yeah. Like it's all about who runs the companies and the examples that they truly set. Right. Yep. And I think it's our responsibility as leaders and entrepreneurs to be the best people we can be so that our people take follow suit. Right. And that they also project that into whatever they're doing. It could be underwater basket weaving or, you know, whatever, insert yeah. here, right? <laughs> and you're pro- you're absolutely right. Like if the industry is going to grow, like dog train, the dog or the pet industry will, man, beautiful. Like uh, that's a great opportunity for the right person, the right mindset and drive to go make something of themselves, right? Yeah. We see the numbers that you and your clients are, and everyone's doing and it's like, wow, man, that's a good, like I thought here like, shit, should I sell my company and become a dog trainer? Cause you guys, yeah. really, <laughs> I would never do that, but yeah, no, I, I, I would tell you, no, uh, <laughs> <laughs> here's the thing that's funny about it is that I, I could, this is our 10 year anniversary since we opened our first location, uh, January, 2014. Thank you. Uh, we, we opened and I never would have imagined what we've built and what we've grown to. I would have never imagined the lessons we've learned in the, the heartache and the pain mm-hmm. and the failures and the wins and the relationships. Like it's crazy thinking about this 10 years. And then I think about, Holy crap, we still have so much to learn. And yeah. like, I personally have so much growth still to, to, to reach what I believe my potential is Right. And so that's why I put myself in rooms and I invest in 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 development and in, in learning because I don't think I have all the answers. I don't I don't know. I've never ran a business, a dog training business the size of the one I'm running right now. So, yeah. you know, when I screw stuff up, I'm like, hey, sorry, you know, but I haven't done this before. And in my world, it's a small number of people that have. And so I'm very fortunate to have mentors and friends um, in the industry who like, like yourself, you're talking about your, your main mentor been around like 20 some odd years in the industry. Like that's your go-to, right? Yeah. If you, if you, and you know a lot cause you've been in it, but there's still times where you're like, I don't know, what's the best way to maybe handle this or how should we go about it? And, you know, I, I still very much feel that way. So I'm super excited for what the next 10 years are to bring. But this is the one thing that's so funny. And I talk about, it, I was like, man, you know, we've always been limited by our growth is dependent upon someone's hand being on a leash. Right. Right. And with, with my company, we're part of a larger franchise model. And so I'm also limited regionally. Okay. And so where we have our franchises, we're blessed. We have multiple, they do extremely well. Um, 
you know, the last year, like everybody's been a little different, you know, a little slower. And then some have really taken off. Some have slowed down depending on the market. Um, but there's still growth and I'm very proud of the teams and what we're doing, but I'm like, man, how do we, how do we help dogs help more people, but we're not limited geographically and we're not limited by having to have our leash, having a leash in our hand, you know, attached to a dog. And that's where we started getting into the software side. That's where we started getting into, uh, media and marketing, you know, pet industry, yeah. sales assistants, front end admin work where we're coming in and taking in kind of like lead acquisition through, um, you know, dog drop off, helping other businesses build up kind of their sales pipelines and marketing processes. And that allows us to impact more dogs and help more people. But I'm not necessarily tied in and limited by can our hands be on a leash? Ah, yeah. Right? And so yeah. that's where it's like, OK, because when I started, it was just me in the backyard. And very quickly, I'm like, oh, man if I really want to help dogs, I want to help people. I got to figure out how to teach people to do what I do. And it's to your point, like you would rather, you're not out bringing clients in or onboarding people. You're connecting them with Josh or one of your other reps, because that's a better experience for that client. Who's like, no, Adam, I really want to work with you. Well, no, you don't. Yeah, no. <laughs> That's like me getting the phone call. Josh, we really want you to train our dog. You trained our other dog eight years ago. I'm like, no, you don't. Yeah, dude, you're probably not even that good at it anymore. Yes. No well, no, it's not. Like I've always said, I want to be the worst dog trainer in my company. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. If I can be the worst dog trainer in my company, we're freaking killing it, bro. If I offer the worst experience, if my <laughs> experience is the worst experience. Now, it's a good experience. But if it's the worst of all the experiences they can get, we're crushing it. Yeah, man, that's a really good. I've never thought of it like that. Right. So what if your your expectation for yourself, If because the thing is, you'll go bring in 500 clients this year if you need to. Yeah. That's just bottom line. You could. Mm -hmm. But is that the best use of your time, no. of your skills, of your reason? Is that what you want to be doing? Not anymore, man. And no. it's really funny that um, it's the ultimate. I, and I talk about this a lot because I, I literally we had a call. What's today? Tuesday. Yesterday with our um, we have there's like 10 of our sales reps. Josh is one of them that like we really pour into. Um, we we give them a lot of training and stuff, things like that to help them. And I was telling them that I'm jealous of them and I'm envious because I miss the hustle. Like I used to leave my house at eight o'clock and come home at five or six and, yeah. you know, with so hopefully with some kills out in the streets, you know, and, and some fresh yeah. clients, all that. And now it's like, I come to the office, I do the boring stuff behind the scenes and then I go home for lunch, um, come back usually. And then like, it's just, it's a different game. It's like a, it's like a change of identity and a struggle. Cause like I'm a salesman, man. I started yeah. out and I can sell all day long. You're right. Um, and I've got the referrals coming in and the, the online presence. It's beautiful, but I'd rather teach other people how to make that happen for themselves so they can build a, a six or seven annual uh, residual, you know, yeah. six or seven figure annual. Like that's what um, you can build in my industry. Um, yeah. And dude, it's, it, um, it's, a, it's a weird change. I just have to say it. Anyone that's gone from scratch to building a business like you for 10 years, man, you, you're, you're not the same person you were back then. And you're, you've had a lot of wins, losses, scars, battle wounds, success, and now you're doing it with leverage, you know? So when my, I was thinking about the year, kind of like reflecting on 2023, that little, that week before between Christmas and New Year's. And I was thinking, I'm not a year, New Year's resolution guy. That's yeah. the dumbest thing I've ever heard. But <laughs> I was either. thinking about, what did I do good this year in this time period, right? That we can represent as a year, right? I'm like, you know, I've been doing so many things without leverage, right? So I thought about that word leverage and that's what my word is for 2024. I'm going to leverage all of my assets to grow my impact, my company and my mission, you know? And so like one of the things I went and did right away was got, a, we got a $1.2 million line of credit. Which yeah. Is fucking amazing to know that as a business owner feels great. And we're going to leverage that and get a 500% return on it this year. Yeah. That's my goal, you know? And yeah. so, um, 
there's risk there, but like I, I am now at a point where I can comfortably say, yeah, I'll bet 1.2 million on these seven different things and mm-hmm. we're going to make it work, uh, make it successful so that we grow. We bring out more people as, as team members, employees, clients, referral partners, and then also um, create more impact. You know, yeah. like I yeah. have a vision that that rate tracker software becomes the credit karma of the payments industry. Credit karma slash Carfax, kind of like how yeah. you car and you say, show me the Carfax. Like I want people to look at Ray Tracker as the standard of certification in terms of like transparency and trust in the payments industry. Love it. The software itself is it's, we'll call it version two and it's solid. It works. It helps people with their fees and they can process payments through it and all that fun stuff. And I want to turn it more into like a CRM slash um, like business finance resource, just like credit card. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I'm working on. One of the things behind the scenes. And that's one of the, that's why I don't sell accounts anymore. You know, but isn't that cool though? How you, you've been able to very similar, like path in the sense that as you've developed other people to serve in an incredible way, the clients from onboarding to, to service after they're already, you know, live with you, it creates this margin for you. Yeah. yeah. Right. And it's like, Hey, I'm going to take less to create more opportunity. We're going to go through this growth phase. I'm going to teach more people how to do this so we can impact, help more people. Now you, you get the right people in place. And this is something I've really experienced over the last 18 to 24 months. I got the right leaders in place that have finally come up and developed and they're in the right roles. And last year was that first time in like nine years that all of a sudden there was margin mm-hmm. and I could sit back for a second and I'm like, we need to do this. This is the next phase. This is the next step. This is how we transition into greater influence and impact. This is how we help more dogs. This is how we help more families. This is how we help meet more people within our industry, not repeat all the mistakes we made early on, so that they can come through and help in a better, greater way. And all of a sudden it's like, Oh, that's a creative idea. Oh, that's a creative idea. But all the stuff that had been kind of buried for years, or maybe was only getting like, cause I'm, I'm a visionary big picture person. I can get into the weeds and the details, but I've got like 90 days before I go in massive depression mode. Yeah, right? dude. Oh, And yes. so now I've got, you know, my COO, Katie, who's just a freaking animal. And she loves all those details. She's like, spit at me the big idea. Let me go figure it out for you. Hell yeah. Now go, go get the next big idea or I'll give her the big idea. And she'll tell me all the reasons it's not going to work and, you know, nitpick and negative me. And then I get pissed and then I may go and make it better. Right. And it's that, that, that push and pull type dynamic, but that's what I've had. And it sounds like that's what you've had. It's like you created that margin where you can get back to, it's like, okay, I envisioned rate tracker. I envisioned having my payment processing company. Holy shit. We're actually doing it. We're having success. I'm not done yet. Yeah, man. What's that next piece look like, but you have to build up that support and you have to build up that team. And this is why I feel like so many, um, owner operators get stuck in operation forever because they're scared to teach someone how to do what they do. Yep. But what happens if they leave? What happens if they go do it themselves? What the, what? I mean, okay. Yeah. But clearly we're not going to people live in fear. We're psychopaths. We went out on our own and risked it all. And yeah. now you're, you're doing it again, coming in big and hot. And you're like, I'm going to leverage this to, to, to go here. Cause that's what it takes to do. And people can go, I mean, God, I probably, I call myself the church planner of the dog world because we've, we, I think we've spun off more dog training companies from past trainers over the 10 years <laughs> than with anybody else in the history of the world. So, you know, I'm like, yeah, I'm the, I'm the church planner of the dog world. Um, but, and here's the thing, I wish them all success if they're good people. If they're good human beings, I wish them great success. If they're shit bags, I'm really going to use any influence I have to make it very difficult for them to operate just because I care about the dogs. And I know you're not a great person. I know that you don't work for me because you're shitty to animals. You're not going to work with animals. I'm sorry. And not, not while I'm here. 
you know? And so, but the ones who, the majority of people who are just like, Hey, I think I see a different way of doing it. I'm not mad at you. I'll even, I'll, I'll help you get going. I'll share with you some lessons. Yeah. Cause dude, you're, you're an abundant thinker. Um, which is how we all should be because the world yeah. is so abundant. And you know what? Um, I tell you this, the idea of margin, that word you said, that is literally what I was talking to my wife last night about. Cause like tomorrow we're taking our three kids to Florida. We're going to do like six week or six day vacation. Good for um, you. And I think my assistant just talked me into leaving my work phone here and bringing just my, uh, my phone that literally calls and texts. That's it. You know, yeah. and I'm pumped for that because I, you know, I've been through some shit. It's entrepreneurship is not easy. And I've been through, um, uh, you know, we all know it, <laughs> but I've had some setbacks and bullshit I've had to deal with, but like we figure it out. That's what we did. We do the work, figure it out, keep moving. It's easy yeah. when you have that approach. Um, and most people, they, most of us are visionaries, right? We're, we, we think about the big picture. We want our business to grow. We want the impact to, of our of our mission to be felt by as many people as possible. Right. Um, and then you realize along the way that it doesn't really have anything to do with money. Sure. Money's cool. Money's great. But sure. like, I'm excited about creating change and feeling like I have a sense of purpose outside of my family. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, like I'd like to be known as the guy that cleaned up the payments industry or, or made America better because small businesses could thrive more. Like that's what I'm shooting for. Yeah, so that's awesome. I'll get in the weeds and handle shit, but it's at the point now where like my team can just do most of it better than me. And like the only time they need me to step in is when they ask and I do my best to stay out. I don't always, because sometimes I see, you know, a client disrespecting Daniel. Of course I'm going to come down on that person and defend my guy. But then Daniel yeah. says, why'd you do that? You didn't need to. It's like, Oh man, it's cause I care. But then yeah. I realized he could have handled it himself. And that's the cool stuff, you know, like yeah. you, the visionary integrator relationship that you mentioned with your COO, that is like the yin and yang of business and mm -hmm. partnerships, relationships, the way businesses operate, you need to have both sides because yes, you need to have a vision and a plan. You also need to execute it. And most of the time it's better to have somebody else or a team that executes the vision. Visionaries need to be doing stuff like this, recording yeah. podcasts and um, sharing our vision and thinking about it and talking about it. And, um, you know, high level stuff. And, and it's really challenging to go from that, like from scratch to like true visionary, um, because there's so many things in the way of that and yep. it's designed that way. It's not easy. Right. My wife always says if this shit was easy, everyone would do it. Yeah. Um, yeah you're right. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Um, yeah Dev, my wife, Devin, she'll, she'll say to me, she's like every day she goes, I do not understand how every day you choose this fight, you know, and it's, you, you said something that was so key and I hope people picked up on it. You're like, it's so beyond the money, mm -hmm. right? Like the, the money comes in and the money goes out. Yeah. The money pays the people to make the business operate. The, the, the money pays for marketing. The money pays for buildings. The money pays, you know, the money goes a lot of places besides myself. You know? <laughs> and, 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 to, and, and to you, you know, if, if I made the money the company made, yeah, that would be really a cool thing. Uh, unfortunately, for those who don't understand it, it doesn't work that way. Um, but it, it is about a greater purpose. And if we didn't love the problem solving, right? We're professional solutions, people, PhD mm -hmm. in solutions that that's all we're doing every single day. And the, the visionary starts out with this idea about what they want to do, but then it's that the visionary skill sets that allow you to come up with the solutions that not everybody else can come up with because we see things differently. And I'm not saying I see things right all the time. I see it differently. My perspective is whack. Like we'll, my wife and I look at two exact same situations and how we would approach it and attack it or solve it or whatever. Cause I would have never thought of it that way. I'm like, no, and I would have never done it that way. And they're just two very, very different people, but it's very unique. And that's why it's like when you're that visionary and you get the people in place who can run your business, 
and yeah. handle your business and control your business because they're so bought in because you've made it clear what your values are, what the mission is, what that experience is supposed to be. When the things that have to come to you come to you, you're clear. Yes. The margin is there where you have clarity and you can actually make a good decision for your business. When you're early on and you're the one bringing in the accounts, you're the one troubleshooting, you're the one installing point of sale systems, you're the ones doing all this. Then a client calls complaining about this. You're trying to jump in the car and take that call. Now that yep. point of sale is only half installed and that pizza you know, restaurant is pissed because they're about to open for lunch and their new system isn't in place. You said it taking an hour, but you're dealing with the Mart down the street on the phone whose credit card processing thing went down. And like, how do we make good decisions in those moments? We, we don't. don't. And we're slaves to our business. And that sucks. Like they, I always say that there's a, there's a part of your business career or your whatever, where your business will own you. Right. Yep. And it, that's not how it should be. You own your business. And so there's a lot of things that need to happen to go from point A to point B. And it literally, in my opinion, when people ask, Hey, what's the most important characteristic of an entrepreneur? It's grit, like pure mm -hmm. grit. Do you really want it? Right? Yeah. I mean, there's a million ways to scale a company and grow and create that, that impact that we want and have time, money, freedom, all that stuff. But it's like it, it. the reason why most businesses fail and never get there is because the people in charge are they don't have the grit or the determination to actually make it happen. Like yep. when my wife and I got married or we got engaged that night, I asked her, I said, what do you want to do with our lives? You know, what do you want to do? And she said, get married, have babies and travel the world. So that is what I think about a lot all the time. And that's what I want to do. I'm adding a fourth thing in there because I found entrepreneurship after our marriage. Yeah, sure. Um, and that is create a positive impact for the world. And I yeah. can do that because I'm an expert in payments. I built a cool company. We take care of our people and our impact is being felt. And I want to multiply that by a million. Right. Yeah, or, dude. I love whatever. that. Yeah, dude. And so the kids right now, like we're traveling to Florida and it's going to be a really fun two hour plane ride. <laughs> Like, I mean, three I, under five, you said, right? Three under five. Yeah. Yeah. Four and a half, two and a half in one year. And so we're just going to, we're just going to make it happen. We'll get there. It'll be fine. But like when they're older, like say in like seven to 10 years, we'll, we'll go, we'll do cool stuff. You know, by then I'll have the money to fly private, you yeah. know, and uh, it'll be an experience to do that. And yeah. um, by then my business is going to be even further built out right? Where I, I truly own it and I can guide it and be, make my, my work and my effort super impactful. That's what I yeah. want. You know, it's dude. I it, love it. Yeah, bro. And that's, that's where I'm tracking. I know you're, you're headed the same direction and it's uh, crazy. So my son, you know, he graduated last year, came on to work for us in August. It's, it's really, really fun. It's kind of, I mean, I don't lack energy, but there has been a new energy that I've had since he's come on board and stuff that he's learning and taking us in a direction potentially that is so different than what I initially imagined. And it's cool because he's bringing stuff to the table that I had never thought about. And it's neat to see his involvement. It's, it's cool that we've built something that probably the greatest honor of my life is having built something that my son wanted to be a part of. Hell yeah. That's cool. And man you know, now I'm like, oh man, I really can't screw this up. You know, <laughs> and, you know, you're, you're talking about grit. I'll tell you what has grit, bro. This gray in my beard. Yeah. I started coloring my beard because I was full white and the gray just keeps creeping back. I got to go color it again. I was looking at it on this camera, the way the lighting is it's like, damn it. <laughs> you know, you know so, so I used to have brown hair. I don't know if you really tell, but it's, I got like a fresh hair, like it's gray basically. Yeah. Gray. And like, so I get haircuts frequently, you know, I'm going to get cut today actually before we go on vacation. Um, but, uh, like my wife is like so bent out of shape cause she's starting to have gray hairs. I'm like, yeah. let's embrace it. And I tell yeah. people, I'm like, it's 90% wisdom, 10% stress. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the last five years I've had three kids, uh, started a business. It failed, started another one from scratch. It's booming. <laughs> yeah. Bro. If, if the, the white of my beard is 90% wisdom, I need to start writing more books because yeah. if there wasn't some simpler in it, this sucker looks like Santa Claus and it's been that way for a while. Uh, that's so funny. Well, look, man, I, 
I can't thank you enough for taking the time uh, to come on here, talk payment processing, talk leadership, talk entrepreneurship. Um, I'm proud to know you. I'm, I'm honored that you, you joined the show. Um, I'm proud to do business with you on a daily basis. Um, we're like I said, we're going to drop a, a link on here and then on all of our socials. You know, we're, it's easy for people to connect with you. How um, how can they follow you on Instagram or Facebook if, if they're interested in doing that? So you can just search me on Facebook, Adam Neese, um, the one with the check mark, not the one that's going to try to sell you crypto investments. I promise you, I will never, ever do that. Um, and, or you can look me up on Instagram. It's at the payments, dude. The payments, dude. I love yeah. it. That's great. Well, look, man, I pray for safe travels for you and your family and an amazing week that you guys and the kids will remember for a lifetime. And uh, I know it'll be rejuvenating. Leave your phone with your assistant. <laughs> and just have a blast. And um, hopefully I'll catch up with you down in Texas here soon. Sounds good, brother, man. I appreciate you having on and uh, having me on. And uh, thank you again. Absolutely. Guys, be sure to subscribe, follow, leave feedback, hit us with any questions that you have for us or Adam. And we'll catch you next time on the Big Dog Podcast. 